Okay, so it'll be my pleasure to tell you about some of the work that we're doing at TGen to advance genomic, um, genomic technologies and computational technologies towards translational research and, um, and cancer care. Um, let me start by giving you a few examples. The first one is from this study where we looked at triple negative breast cancer study. So this is a study that we did in collaboration with U.S. Oncology and, uh, and Life Technologies. Um, uh, John Carpton, Dan Von Hoff, Joyce O'Shaughnessy, and a number of others got together and developed um, a, a really sophisticated protocol for looking at whole genomes and looking at multiple dimensions. And this included looking at whole genomes to, to, to get copy numbers and translocations, looking at deep exomes to get all of these sequence variants, and then also looking at gene expression so we can have multiple dimensions of information so we can get to as you heard from Andre, getting to the, to the systems, to, to the mechanistic understanding for each patient. Uh, we focused on 14 patients, but a deep dive on each patient. Um, the, um, let's see if I can go to the next slide. So, so there's a, a, an entire uh, pipeline of analyses that starts from the tissue all the way to um, uh, generating libraries, sequencing those libraries, uh, aligning all of that information and then getting to the point where you get information that could be used, interpreted intelligently at the mechanistic level that could guide interventions. Um, when, when you think about the computational challenge of taking whole genomes, generating hundreds of billions of measurements for each patient, terabytes of data, and then translating that, it, it's equivalent to taking law libraries, shredding them, and then reassembling them again. So this is the work of uh, David Craig and his bioinformatics team. He's developed a fantastic software pipeline for interpreting genomic information, uh, visualizing it, and helping uh, a team come together and interpret it. Uh, so the interpretation, uh, again, it's not, we're trying to get away from biomarker phishing, right? We're not just looking at what things do we know. Are there things that we can understand and interpret? Uh, this, this is one example. This is patient two on this trial. Um, we identified, for example, a number of converging changes, not just mutations, not just copy number, not just gene expression, but looking at various types of alterations that all converge on particular pathways and, and uh, mechanisms. And as you can see here, the convergence suggested that it's not just one pathway that's activated, it's two. And you heard a little bit about the importance of synergy and coming up with combinations. Well, here's a, a, a poster child example of where you see a mechanism. There's no evidence-based medics, and there's no epidemiological evidence to suggest a treatment here. This is intelligently interpreting a mechanism and coming up with treatment suggestions that may not have ever been tested in any other patient. And, and th this is where our challenge is. It turns out that the best way to target these two pathways together are two experimental therapeutics. And, and again, thanks to Dan Von Hoff and Joyce O'Shaughnessy and their connections, they were able to identify a clinical trial where we had two inhibitors, a MEK inhibitor and an AKT inhibitor together in this particular trial. So we were able to get this triple negative breast cancer patient onto this trial. She was, I think, one of the last, and, and nobody was responding to this combination of treatment. In fact, these drugs would have not survived, but we had one of these miraculous responses. I mean, you could see this is a, a breast tumor at the, uh, on, on, the, on the left here. Uh, it, was, it was perforating through the skin and, and fungating and just not responding to any treatment. This combination of um, uh, a MEK AKT inhibitor combination just annihilated the tumor. It, it left a hole where the tumor used to be. So, so we see these amazing responses when you look at mechanism. But the, this is the first point I wanted to make, that this is not evidence-based medicine. This is mechanistic interpretation of genomic information. And as we go through, we've done about 100 tumor boards. So you take a, a multidisciplinary team at, at TGen, and we're going through these, these approaches where we take this information and we go through this process of interpreting it and getting a medical interpretation and getting a clinical intervention. So that pipeline is increasingly done by teams of scientists and physicians coming together. And, and usually they're not all in the same institute. So we needed to create ecosystems that allow us to share clinical knowledge across institutions. Um, the IT infrastructure behind this is really sophisticated. So we start to think about two problems. One is geographical distribution, but then the other problem is we have disparate types of data because it's not just genomic information that weighs into the decision. 
it's also clinical information. It's also pharmacological information. So we've created data portals that allow us to bring these things together and communication tools that allow physicians, scientists, and multidisciplinary teams to come together to interpret information. And as you heard before, as we start to transition from science into big team engineering projects, these types of tools become more important because there isn't a single individual that knows all of the information that's necessary to interpret this type of information. So um, as, as misleading as this, <laughs> this title is, we, we still believe in the team science approach. We believe that there is this hybrid between uh, really intelligent individuals who know how to interpret pathways and, and mechanisms and systems uh, that come together with clinician scientists, that come together with uh, pharmacologists and pharmacists and, uh, and oncologists to create an interpretation that would otherwise not be possible by an individual. Uh, the, the latest trial to take on this model is, is, the, is a stand-up to cancer project led by Jeff Trent and, and Patricia LaRusso. Uh, it's focused on melanoma, focusing on the problem of what do you do with um, BRAF negative um, melanoma. And, and it involves, a, again, a, a very large team of institutions across the country. Um, the unique thing about this model is that it's, it's taking a, a, a set of commercial agents that are going to be available for this particular trial. And this is, this is a randomized trial. But, but the really interesting thing is we're starting to think about inter, introducing investigational agents. So we're not thinking about the traditional drug development trial approach where you take a single agent and, and or you take multiple drugs and you create multiple arms. We're starting to think about fusing uh, molecular medicine with clinical drug development. And in fact, the, the thing that's allowing us to do this, again, comes back to how we, our approach to knowledge, our approach to how do you collect information. So on the top left, we have billions of, billions of bits of information about pathways, mechanisms, models of drug response. Uh, all of that information could be integrated into a single platform. Then we could take all of the patient information, bring that in, so we could take genomes, gene expression, copy number, all of the various dimensions of molecular medicine, plus prior history, clinical information, bring all of those things together and create a single knowledge repository that allows us to do both basic research, but also do molecular medicine, and, and in the future, integrate clinical trial development so we could do it all together. And bringing all that information together and doing it is, is, a, is a major project that we've undertaken at TGen. We're calling the repository Bionet, uh, and we're getting support from Dell to build the, uh, the IT infrastructure behind that. So what does this look like in the future? Well, we would love to develop uh, a systems oncology clearinghouse, because we don't want to, again, do um, uh, fishing expeditions to find the biomarker that has epidemiological evidence. We want to take all of the information together, create a systems understanding of what's wrong with that patient, and tailor the treatment. And if that treatment's not available, be able to use this as a clearinghouse to find the right clinical trial, put that patient into that clinical trial. So we're positioning experimental therapeutics with profiled patients together. And, and this is a vision that, that is it's not our vision. We've shared it with a lot of other people. But this, this is not enough. Uh, this is, we don't have enough prior knowledge that we could put into the system. We don't have enough systems modeling that we could put into the systems. This will take everybody coming together, and we have to create rapid iterative learning. This is something Bill Dalton has been saying for decades. We really need to capture the learning from the N of 1 and integrate it to get better, to get a better understanding of how we can build better, more predictive models of drug response. Again, we see the opportunity to take these types of platforms and integrate uh, personalized cancer care, molecular profiling, clinical drug development, and basic drug mechanism modeling. All of these things should be under, under one research enterprise called systems oncology. If we can take the learning from systems uh, modeling and molecular profiling and make them available for both personalized medicine and drug development together, we can accelerate all of these things together. But at the end of the day, again, we don't have enough information about how drugs, uh, how to predict the response of a drug based on systems right now. We need this to be a learning exercise, and we need to learn from the end of one. Finally, we don't see this as a centralized database. We see this as a federated network of clearing houses. We see the opportunity to use uh, network technologies to bring together individuals 
data repositories, knowledge repositories, high performance computing, all together across a large network. So the federating this is probably the only way to do this and do it in a way that we could scale. So in terms of uh, the, the conclusion, what we're really trying to think about is not to think about precision medicine and clinical drug development as two separate enterprises, two separate things. We're trying to, because at the end of the day, the way we use systems modeling, the way we use clinical information, the way we use genomic information to match the two, fundamentally the science behind this is the same. Uh, whether you're starting with a single patient and trolling through the universe of therapeutic options, or starting with a single drug and looking at cohorts of patients to identify ones that are going to respond, you're still using the same fundamental connectivity in the middle. So we really see this as, as an opportunity to bring those things together. So these are the, the folks that have contributed to this. And in terms of the policy opportunities that we see, we want to start thinking about are there, um, are, are we instituting um, the unneeded policy changes around precision medicine? Can we bring, can, can we instead of creating new policies to regulate precision medicine, can we think about fusing what we're already doing in clinical drug development and trying to do that a little bit smarter? So taking personalized medicine, clinical drug development, and, and seeing if we can just treat those as flip sides of the same uh, um, coin. How do we uh, refine our policies around genom genomic data interpretation and uh, to inform clinical decisions? You heard a little bit about this from Andre. The, the, the opportunity here is to get away from just simply saying this is a biomarker which is clinically proven to predict this drug with epidemiological statistical information and to get to intelligent interpretation of systems. We're not yet able to use systems modeling to accurately predict all drug responses. We need to learn how to do that. But we can't be blinded by the progress that we're seeing by just choosing single biomarkers and seeing some predictivity. Uh, it's like trying to get to the moon uh, by climbing up a tall tree. We're going to be making progress all the way to the top. But once we get to the top, that's it. I mean, we systems modeling is the only way that we can get there. And right now, there are no good policies that allow us to use a systems approach to interpret uh, medical interventions. And finally, um, this ties back to the point number three, uh, evidence-based medicine and N of one are fundamentally different approaches to healthcare delivery. Uh, we don't have epidemiological evidence when N equals one. At least that's what our statisticians tell us. Uh, so what, what constitutes evidence? We need a new epistemology to define the type of knowledge that could be used to justify treatment decision. And we argue that that justification can be done with mechanistic knowledge. Um, so that's another thing to grapple with, and there's a lot of issues that we could talk about that. Okay. How do we have all the 